Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the next edition of the Benjamin Franklin House Virtual Talks. Today, I am delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Cara Rodway. She's the Deputy Head of the Eccles Center for American Studies at the British Library, and she will be speaking today on the motel in America. Um, and so uh, thank you very much for coming, Cara, and I'll pass it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Caitlin, um, and to all your colleagues at the Benjamin Franklin House um, for inviting me. It was really lovely to be asked to contribute to your to your series. Um, and also, I should just say thank you to the many uh, colleagues, friends and family uh, who've contributed to this research over the years. Uh, the topic of motels is something I've been working on for about 15 years. So it's been it, there's quite a lot of. Um, in fact, it's actually probably longer than that. I can't do the mental maths. Anyway, <laughs> um, it's something that I've been interested in for a really long time. And so, yeah, there's a lot of conversations that have gone uh, into this. So as, uh, as the colleagues at Benjamin Franklin House very kindly invited me, I obviously started uh, racking my brains trying to think how I could connect my research to, uh, to the house and to Franklin's life, since my research obviously sits in the 20th century. Um, and as many of you may know, uh, Franklin was intimately concerned with the state of America's roads. As Postmaster General, he wanted to calculate distances traveled and he thus produced an odometer, which he attached uh, to a carriage wheel to um, measure the number of rotations and thus calculate uh, distance and then quickest routes. And so by using a faster routes and standardizing postage charges, he uh, managed to make the US Post Office profitable. And uh, I've included here a slide showing um, examples of, of the odometer. Um, you can see sort of inside it a little bit on the top. Um, this is obviously totally tangential, but this is my effort at making this all seem super relevant. Um, so this uh, interest in, uh, in speeding up commerce and communication can certainly be found uh, in the road improvements, which uh, came with the arrival of, the, of first the bicycle and then the automobile in the late 19th century. Um, and then these are changes obviously solidified in the numbered national US highways, which developed from the mid 1920s of which uh, Route 66 is probably the best known. And then obviously the interstate program uh, 30 years later. And so my motel story is of course intimately bound up with roads and distance. So uh, despite the, uh, the slight tangential nature, I do hope that Franklin would approve. So um, I'm gonna talk uh, for about uh, 30 minutes, um, a, a bit of a kind of uh, cruise through um, motel history. And then um, I'm very happy to take any questions or if there's anything uh, any slides you want me to come back to, I will endeavour to remember what the images are, some of which uh, I'm better at doing than others, but I can always look things up and, uh, and share information later. So here, uh, just on this slide, I've included uh, a few examples, I suppose, of what we think of as the, the kind of classic image of the motel, you know, the neon, big neon sign, uh, the, you know, the vacancy uh, line. And I really got interested in thinking about motels uh, in America through reading Lolita while I was a, um, a master's student. And I don't know if many people know the book. Obviously, it has a, a very sort of complex and charged history. But the one thing that I found very interesting was that the whole sort of second half of the book is really structured around trips to motels. So the whole sort of this whole road trip that Humbert and Lolita take is based in motels. And it's really apparent when you read it that Nabokov is has chosen motels very specifically. He's using them to do some kind of cultural work in the, in the text. And so I really got interested in thinking about, you know, why was that? Why in the 19, late 1940s was, you know, was this outsider looking at America finding these spaces to be so um, potent? And so this has led me through my work to think about why lodging as a category is really interesting. Um, I, Obviously, at first glance, many people would, would think it, it isn't, um, but I would, I hope I will slightly convince you that, that it is. And one of the things is obviously that travel um, brings social change into, into stark relief. And motels uh, are what I call threshold or liminal spaces. They're kind of home on the road, but they're also um, you know, an anonymous spaces, spaces where kind of exciting and transgressive things can happen, but at the same time, they're also quasi-domestic, um, as the sort of home on the road idea uh, suggests. And I've always been really interested in how all these tensions together, all these elements uh, mix with this destabilizing quality of travel. You know, if you, you are, you know, people, you know, travel for all kinds of reasons, but there's, there's always something quite interesting to be found there. Um, and this is how I, 
I would argue that the motel space generates meaning. But a quick little note on, on terminology to, to start us off. Um, we think of motels and we all kind of know what that means, but uh, it took a while actually for that uh, terminology to become dominant. So in the early period, which I'm going to start with, um, you hear um, courts, camps, cabins, cottages, lots of sea sounds. Um, so it's, um, you know, you're like auto camp, um, auto court, motor court. So all these different, these different terms. Um, and motel really had to, which comes from motor hotel, for those who don't know, it really had to beat out these other de designations to become preeminent in the 1940s. Um, one of, and there's lots of other sort of weird avenues. One I quite like is that the, the term hotel, as in automobile hotel, um, but obviously it probably sounds far too French to have actually ever caught on. Uh, I, I don't think the sort of the associations, you know, in the American popular culture of sort of Frenchness and kind of, you know, class really worked with, <laughs> with what the motel space was trying to go for. Um, so I'm going to touch on first a little bit is what is the context out of which um, motels first emerged? This is a little bit of a kind of flip through um, um, lodging history. So in the sort of early years of the 20th century, you had a number of different uh, forms of lodging that obviously made up the kind of lodging market. You had smart resort hotels. Uh, you've got an example there in the top um, left-hand corner. You had big downtown hotels uh, on the top uh, right. And then you also had other forms. So you have, for example, a railroad hotel, um, that's down bottom left. And then uh, bottom right, you also had um, tourist homes, which would be much more sort of familiar to, say, Europeans, uh, you know, certainly Brits as a kind of B&B, &B, you know, these are sort of often accommodations in people's homes. Um, and a, a, another example, which isn't, um, I haven't pictured, which, which sort of kind of is somewhere between the downtown hotel and the tourist home was often what were called drummers hotels, which were sort of slightly um, less fancy urban hotels designed particularly for traveling salesmen or drummers, um, as they were known. And so one thing to think about is how gender works in these different spaces. So um, the drummers hotels were very male spaces. Um, downtown hotels were, were very smart. You know, you think of, you know, smoking rooms, um, whereas say a resort hotel was much more, was often much more feminine. Um, families often led by um, the mother would go and, you know, might stay in a resort hotel for a, you know, particularly I'm talking to upper class tourists, um, for a period and the, the husband visiting. Um, but uh, that's one of the things that's quite interesting then about the motel is that it became, it, it made a good pitch for being family friendly. Um, and that's one thing that sort of helps it in its development. Um, so I can come back and talk about any of these examples briefly uh, at the end if anyone's interested. So the other, so you obviously have the, the lodging industry, but then you also had the emergence of uh, auto camping, um, which was really in vogue from the teens. Uh, also called gypsying. It was, um, you know, this idea of getting off the beaten track and back to nature. You can think of the National Parks movement, obviously, that was starting around the same time. And for a lot of these auto tourists, they spoke about, you know, the freeing effect of being able to get away from the strictures of railway timetables uh, or, you know, even, you know, railway lines, you know, your, your route being dictated by, um, by the rails. Um, but also you were getting away from the formality of hotels. You didn't have to worry about, you know, tipping or wearing the right clothes or, you know, you could just um, get back to this sort of this back to nature democratic uh, movement. And so lots of different um, areas keen, obviously, to encourage tourist travel um, started offering uh, free municipal camps, campsites. Um, aimed at attracting tourists. And interestingly, then in the 1920s, these started to give way to, to pay camps, the, the, the free ones started to, to disappear. And one thing I think it's interesting to think about in this period is, how, is the sort of democratic ideals which were bound up in this vogue for camping. So getting away from the sort of stuffy forms of tourism, uh, promoters, as I suggested, sort of saw the camps as freeing and refreshing. Um, and so the, the, the pictures that I've used on this slide, you have obviously a, a a camping scene at the top and the bottom one is actually a bespoke tent system that you could purchase for your uh, for your car um, and I'm not a car historian that is obviously a whole other thing but I think that that's a pretty expensive looking car so and I imagine this tent system wouldn't be wouldn't be cheap um, so what many of these um, discussions about uh, gypsying tourism and auto tourism 
in many of these discussions, they implicitly saw the appearance, though, of upper class travellers as the marker of success and cultural approval. Um, poor travellers who need to stay in free camps due to uh, economic necessity were generally considered a menace rather than a marker of a sort of successful democratic experiment. Um, and many municipal camps really struggled to handle the volume of travellers, as I've suggested, and the facilities became unsanitary and overcrowded and, you know, undesirable residents became a problem. And so I've just included a few different examples here. Um, I quite like, I don't know if you can all see it on maybe on small screens, but the top picture on the left is a camp in Florida in, I think, Christmas Day 1920. And I have no idea why there's a horse, but there is. Um, and then uh, the going clockwise, you have an example, I think it's Yellowstone National Park, another example from Florida from the mid 20s and then um, the, the next the final example is a municipal camp from Washington DC I don't know if you can see um, but right in the middle so very misty is the is the monument um, Washington monument um, so that sort of gives you a little bit of a feel so in the mid 20s as I've said many municipal camps closed or were given over to private managers um, and the arrival of private camps really heralded the beginning of the motel industry as owners began to add rudimentary cabins. Um, this obviously also happened to other roadside businesses, so farmers or uh, gas station um, owners started to add um, new facilities, which then became increasingly sophisticated. And these new cabins were, um, I would suggest, new sort of architectural, but also social spaces. And whilst many were indeed developed from sort of rough wooden sheds, as the previous slide showed, um, and were indeed sometimes converted from farm uh, facilities like chicken coops as their detractors were always ready to point out um, motel owners were very quick to see that the motoring public were happy to pay a bit extra to leave camping equipment at home and to um, experience additional convenience um, and facilities so there was a real variety of obviously what was on offer in the, the 20s and 30s which is really the beginning of the, of the sort of motel proper um, these are two postcards both from maryland um, just to give you a, sort of a, a bit of a flavor so the top one is obviously a gas station which then has cottages attached to it and you can see they're deliberately echoing kind of homely design styles um, and then the second one is uh, slightly more modernist you can see the the uh, the modern what they call an eyebrow running around the um in blue in the around the, the restaurant and you can see that you know, the the block glass windows and things so there's and interestingly of course that's using motel um hyphenated to make you aware of where it comes from but uh you can see how there was there was a lot of variety um and this nice illustration comes from a really wonderful book called the motel in america um which is a, a kind of cultural geography of, of motel history which i really recommend for anyone who's interested in this and it was one of the first books that i Sort of picked up about the subject um, and this illustration really conceptualizes the changes that took place across the first of 40 years thinking about how space uh, changed you know so you've got that the auto camp and the tourist home cabin camps cottage courts and then you start to get the larger businesses until you get a sort of multi-story motor in at number five and then the highway hotel which i'll touch on a little bit later so what was going on in these tourist courts or cabin camps? Um, and unsurprisingly, the sort of celebratory discussions of, of democratic social mixing and the wonderful opportunities of inexpensive car travel um, were always in competition with more salacious stories. So the privacy afforded by cabin camps, especially when considered next to the formalities of hotels, proved attractive to what was known uh, as the couple trade, or more descriptively, the bounce on the bed trade. And whilst many enemies um, of tourist camps, notably the hotel industry, and many of uh, actually of the motel industry's proponents were, were keen to encourage a clean image, um, you know, these groups actually together were always ready to kind of decry the, uh, the moral decay uh, that came from tourist camps that catered to the couple trade. Um, but for, actually for many motel business owners, it was a, a kind of necessary part of their income. Um, if couples wanted rooms for short periods, you could let them a number of times. And also um, in areas dependent on seasonal travel, couple trade actually tended to be local. So that was a way of kind of seeing yourself through the, uh, the, the, the low season. Um, and in the mid 1930s, Southern Methodist University published a study of the tourist court trade in Dallas um, and reported that actually more than half of the business done in local camps was couple trade. And the study's findings were reported with uh, much glee in the New Republic. Uh, which noted uh, that the university report says that very few of the women who visit these camps are professional prostitutes 
a map of Dallas has been published with dots to indicate the home addresses of the owners of automobiles used in the couple trade, a map the publication of which must have given some Dallas residents heart failure. The map indicates that practically none of the clientele is from slums or semi-slums, but on the contrary comes from the wealthiest sections of the city. And whilst the report noted that uh, wisely the university presents this information without any emotional colour, simply as a bit of evidence of the changing character of our civilization, others uh, weren't so... Uh, um, weren't so... Uh, discreet, let's say. So uh, one of uh, another wonderful example of the kind of the detractors of, of motels um, is a 1940s article by J. Edgar Hoover, which was published in American magazine, which um, attacked camps of crime. And uh, with very little evidence, he charged that the majority of camps were dens of vice and corruption, frequented by nomadic prostitutes, hardened criminals, white slavers and promiscuous college students. And uh, rather nicely, the industry publication, the Tourist Court Journal, uh, noted that there would always be those interested in the more lurid aspects of any business. And they quote, story writers are constantly in search of the new locale for an old plot. And it is flattering to the Tourist Court that even the best writers are aware of this tremendous industry still in its teens. Um, and indeed, the combination of mobility and anonymity bound up in the tourist court did prove attractive to writers and creatives. And tourist courts featured widely in literature and film in the, in the 30s and 40s. So for film noir, tourist courts represented the, the kind of the, the liminal status of many of their heroes. Um, and on the flip side, motels, uh, reputations as spaces for social mixing meant that they sat well um, as a thematic backdrop for the travels of the heiress and the journalist in Frank Capra's 1934 It Happened One Night, which is uh, what this still is taken from. Um, for anyone who, who's not familiar with the film, it's a wonderful uh, screwball comedy. Um, but as you can see, the, the, the risque potential of the motel is very present and they're, they're making good use of that um, as uh, the, the hero and heroine have to separate the, uh, the room with the blanket, which uh, we're led to believe falls down. So jumping forward ever so slightly um, through the, the Second World War, which um, was a time when um, many motels experienced, you know, were full, there were lots of motels were used as accommodation for workers in um, defence plants and that kind of thing, um, but there was there wasn't much development obviously of the, of the industry in the period, um, as with many industries during the war years. So then in the post-war period, it, was a re it became a real time, to, uh, boom time to be in the motel business. And the displacement of people caused by uh, the war economy meant that the first years of peace saw Americans take to the road, whether that was to return home or to travel to new jobs or simply to enjoy the freedom that came with growing economic prosperity. Um, and the increasing popularity of the car coupled with new road building and then obviously the implementation of the interstate program 10 years later meant that more and more of these travelers needed convenient accommodation at the roadside. And so in the 11 years between 1946 and 1957, the number of motels in the US uh, almost tripled going from 20,000 to over 56,000. And so whereas in the depression, some of the examples I was showing you earlier, um, roadside lodgings were the inexpensive option. Um, the motels of the late 40s and early 50s were newly modernised uh, and privatised spaces catering to an in increasingly discerning public. And as architectural critics Jeffrey Baker and Bruno Fonaro observed in their 1955 book Motels, the motel had become, quote, a symbol of up-to-dateness of informality and modern planning. And as motels continually strove to improve in light of kind of developing competition, Owners installed things like um, some things you can see in these pictures, you know, fitted carpets, brand name mattresses, telephones, televisions. And for many Americans, these were their first experiences of these uh, consumer comforts. Um, and they, they really helped bring travelers into the national cycles of consumption, which shaped post-war American life. However, by the 1960s, typically individually owned motels and other services that had prospered and professionalized in the previous decade were quickly swallowed by the standardizing force of corporate franchising. I'm going to touch on that a little bit at the end. So the visible success of the motel industry also produced a mini publishing boom in what I call uh, motel management memoirs. And these were generally lightly uh, fictionalized and humorous accounts of running small-scale motels. 
there's two examples here. And interestingly, both of these were written by aspiring writers. The, uh, the Brents, the couple who wrote Grand Motel, had um, experience as uh, screenwriters. And whilst Nancy Vogel, who wrote Four and Twenty Beds, uh, also worked for the local paper while she and her husband, Grant, tried to run their motel and raise two small children, which she writes about in the book. And as the cover designs of these suggest, these, uh, these memoirs, um, these and, and others that I found over the period, um, generally sort of thrive on the comic potential of the motel. Um, I mean, some are a little bit more sort of dry and po-faced, but these two examples, which were two of my favourites, um, yeah, there's a lot of humour of sort of, you know, the, the fast elements of opening wrong doors and, you know, finding scantily clad people and that kind of thing. Um, and Nancy Vogel, who wrote Four and Twenty Beds, I was actually able to, to interview as part of my doctoral research many years ago, and she shared some lovely um, images from the family scrapbook that they'd kept were, during the time of running their motel. And so these are, these are genuine uh, images from her, her and her family when they, they ran the Sunset Motel in Banning, California uh, in, the, in the late 40s. Um, and although, yeah, Vogel does a very good job of making it very funny and very entertaining in the book, um, she, did, she you know, told me that actually it was extremely hard work um, you know, running a business and looking after children and also working um, part time as, as a writer. And they, they sold the business after, I think, a year or two. Um, and you can see, uh, yeah, you can see her family, young family, and uh, some nice stage photos. I think some of these were taken for a local magazine that did a, a piece when the book was published. Um, and what I find particularly striking reading these works is how, as I mentioned at the beginning, this sort of quasi-domestic aspect of the motel really allowed white middle-class married women a space in the workforce, which didn't seem to disrupt the status quo. Um, and whilst the memoirs did show the authors negotiating the realities of, of a motel, uh, such as the presence of those wishing to use the rooms for illicit sexual activity, uh, a common thread, um, ultimately these, uh, the motels and these stories were really infused with the power to enlarge an individual's personal and professional experience and outlook. And so you, you, can, you can really uh, find these, these uh, individuals sort of, yeah, have, find, finding opportunities for personal and professional growth through, through these motel spaces. And so whilst increasing numbers of, of black Americans also wanted to embrace the freedom of the road in the decades after the war and tap into the associations and promises that automobility and the roadside generated, such as personal freedom, upward mobility and consumer comfort, traveler, travel obviously remained fraught with challenges in a segregated country. And detailed planning of any long journey was vital in order to avoid humiliation or even personal danger for travelers of color in the period. As Senator Hubert Humphrey observed after hearing testimony before Congress, black travelers were forced to, as he put it, draw up travel plans much as a general advancing across hostile territory. Despite the existence of some small circulation travel guides prior to the mid-1930s, the most famous travel guide for black Americans, the Negro Motorist Green Book, was founded by New York postal worker Victor Green in 1936. And initially a small publication of just 16 pages covering only the New York metropolitan area, after the war in 1947, it had uh, grown to 84 pages. And the business success of the guide, which ultimately ran uh, for three decades, offers a way of divining obviously how serious the need was among black travelers for reliable information about accommodations. And interestingly, and you can see this on this, this cover from the 1941 edition, uh, the Green Book listed not only guest houses and hotels in larger cities, but also supper clubs, night spots, personal services such as hairdressers. And taken in total, the pages of the guide uh, really combine to give a very sort of powerful sense of the challenges of traveling within a world bounded so fiercely by prejudice. And obviously, you know, you can imagine that whilst in their local neighborhoods, uh, black Americans in this period might know how to traverse the built environment and the cultural nuances of segregation. You know, once they were on the road, negotiating these vagaries could be experiences fraught with tension, um, with regional variations often hard to comprehend. And so that was, that was one of the, the motivating reasons for producing the guide. And whilst it's still the best known though, the Green Book wasn't the only travel guide produced for African-Americans uh, during this period. Um, the post-war uh, 
travel guide um, was subtitled Vacation and Recreation Without Humiliation. You can see that on the bottom of the covers of these issues. And it was much more consciously aspirational in its design. And these two issues, for example, uh, feature glamorous and well-made up female models. Um, the example on the left, you know, they're, they're obviously you're meant to be playing golf in a convertible. And then on the um, on the right, you know, they're participating in, in air travel, um, obviously very, um, very exciting um, and very, as I say, aspirational forms of, of travel and recreation. And looking at these and other guides, as well as the ways that campaigning groups such as the NAACP use the challenges of travel as part of their calls for reform, it's really clear that in this period, middle class African Americans interlinked travel and citizenship in order to demand full rights within democratic America. And these guides really reveal the psychological and political importance of travel before and during the civil rights era. Um, and one of the things that I found really interesting was to think about the ways in which it's this peculiar combination of, sort of public and private found in roadside services, which, um, which campaigners put, sort of put into motion in arguing for, uh, for the Civil Rights Act um, and Title uh, Four of the Civil Rights Act is all about um, public accommodations. It's a, it's a very key part of that, of that legislation. It was an important part of the campaigning. And so, uh, whilst motels might have acted as legitimate cornerstones of family travel for, as I've said, civil rights activists wanting to cement the place of black travellers in the popular imagination and the body politic, the transgressive appeal of the motel uh, never went away. And as you can imagine, it was also one of the, the reasons why a lot of racist uh, um, detractors campaigning against uh, integrated accommodations, uh, one of the things that they, they pointed to. But there are many, many cultural products from the post-war period which really revel in the perceived opportunities for violence, sex and depravity uh, represented by the motel. And I've included just, just two examples here. There are, there are others and I'm sure uh, many people can, can think of their own. Um, I wanted to, to share this as a most marvellous poster. On the left, we have uh, the Marilyn Monroe starring Niagara, which is a um, suspense thriller, uh, really a kind of film noir in colour which follows a young wife's attempt to kill her husband so she can run off with her lover. And the eponymous location of Niagara and the tourist court where they're all living uh, is a really powerful force in the film. Um, and it really becomes implicit in the action as Rose, one of character, seeks to sort of exploit tourist features in the town as part of her sort of murderous plan. So um, using the, the, the local bells and things. Um, and the, uh, the horror film Psycho, uh, illustrated on the right, contains probably uh, one of the most famous representations of motels in American popular culture, uh, the Bates Motel, the site of a number of murders by schizophrenic Norman Bates, played obviously by Anthony Perkins and his alter ego mother. And the treatment of the motel in the film, especially in relation to the physically dominant Bates house on the hill, which you can see in this um, still of the set, um, connects to the film's examination of the pressures of family and the weight of the past on the present. Um, and obviously the, the motel is, is, is meant to be modern and the, you know, this Victorian house is, is gothic um, and filled with horror. And so as with these two examples, motels in this period were often seen as containers for a, a destabilizing and deviant female sexuality. And that's a, a really common trope that that goes on through kind of cultural products using motel locations. But as many psycho fans may remember, the Bates Motel has fallen on hard times because the highway has been rerouted. And the 1950s, as I've mentioned, saw major changes to the American road with the arrival of the interstate building program. The limited access design of these roads, um, so you can't just drive on and off them at, at lots and lots of side roads, you know, they have specific uh, points, interchange points. Uh, meant that the real estate at the exits and interchanges became very, very expensive and led to changes in the motel industry. And so larger highway hotels became the new standard. They needed much more finance. Um, you know, you, you needed, it, it wasn't just, you know, you could build a couple of cabins one season and then add some more the next, as had been kind of the way in the in you know, a few decades earlier. And so these, with the appearance of these larger highway hotels, many smaller um, independently owned or mom and pop as they were called motels on older roads struggled to keep up. 
And at the same time, new franchising models, such as that used um, by Kemmons Wilson uh, and Holiday Inn, started to produce new standardization across the industry. And obviously there were many positive features for travelers to come out of this, you know, more reliable facilities, predictable quality, standard pricing. And also I think this is an, is an interesting kind of side note that actually larger corporate structures were more receptive to demands for integration and better treatment of minority travelers. Um, as nationwide companies, they were more susceptible to, to boycotts coming from all different regions. But the standardization also contributed to um, a soullessness, which uh, became increasingly associated with motel travel in the later 20th century. Um, and then which went sort of hand in hand with the perceived transgressiveness and risk associated with older crumbling motels. So I'm going to uh, finish with one of my favorite uh, slightly nutty motel texts, which really grapples with the um, mundane ubiquity of motels. Um, a really wonderfully funny graphic novel from 1979 called The Motel of the Mysteries by David Macaulay. And they're playing on the fad for Egyptology, which surfaced in America during the 70s, obviously associated with the, the Tutankhamun exhibition. Macaulay uh, used the motel as a satiric symbol for late 20th century American culture. Um, I don't have time to, to describe the book in detail, but it is, it's very enjoyable. Um, and it's, it's set in the year um, 4022. And the book tells how in 1985, following an environmental disaster uh, triggered by a deluge of junk mail, virtually all life was extinguished on the North American continent. And so thousands of years later, um, archeologist Howard Carson discovers a motel which he believes to be a funerary complex and is thrilled to find within corpses prepared for the afterlife in what, what he believes to be the traditional fashion. And the humour is obviously generated for the reader by the gap between the mundane tasks the dead are actually performing in their motel rooms, such as watching TV or taking a bath, as the, the previous image, uh, which Carson then, of course, misinterprets as evidence of powerful sombre ceremonies loaded with spiritual significance. Um, a perspective which, in turn, offers the reader an ironic commentary on 20th century life, a place where, for instance, the TV has perhaps assumed the role of the great altar and the high priestess chants while wearing a toilet seat sanitized for your convenience, of course. So I'm going to, uh, to end there. I really hope I've been able to demonstrate some of the rich history of the motel in America. Um, and I encourage you all to think about the meaning of these quotidian everyday spaces next time you find yourself uh, pulling up to one or just see one uh, pop up on TV. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cara. That was really interesting. And um, the, the graphic novel sounds a lot of fun as well. So I may actually look, up, look it up afterwards. So, <laughs> um, so we do have time for questions now. Um, for those of you who haven't used Zoom webinar before, there are two ways that you can ask questions. Um, you can either um, raise your hand and I can call on you so you can ask uh, Cara the question directly, uh, or you can write your question in the Q&A. Um, so those are your two options. So um, yes, so if anybody would like to ask a question. Go ahead. <laughs> and obviously I can bring the I can bring the presentation back up if anyone has any specific questions about the uh, any of the images. Uh, so we have a first question that's come in. It says uh, your presentation has almost um, well, uh, your presentation has a quality as though the greatest days of motels are behind us. What is the future of motels in your opinion? Well, that's a that's a great a great question, and yes, there's certainly I suspect an awful lot of nostalgia probably wrapped up in my um, in my talk as much as in sort of uh, a lot a lot of, of scholarship about about motels, and some of that does come from um, and I didn't really touch on it so much, but yeah, the sort of the the, the architectural work. So there's there's a lot of interest in uh, in the eighties particularly in preserving kind of what's called vernacular architecture and a lot of motels, early motels sort of fell into that. There's a really wonderful examples, you know, there was a regional chain of motels um, called the Wigwam Motels, which uh, there were sort of um, generally around the sort of upper south Kentucky, which were all shaped like wigwams, you know, so you have these very kind of quirky um, buildings. And the same was true of things like diners as well. Um, Yes, yeah, so the motel industry is a really interesting one because it, it hasn't gone away. It, is, it definitely does still have a place. Um, and one of the things that I found quite interesting in my research, and I have noticed a few more sort of scholars pick up on recently, is that as um, 
as patterns of, of ownership change, I said, you know, you had these big, very expensive sort of highway hotels and, and big chains. A lot of smaller motels have, um, have actually uh, come to be owned by um, Indian Americans, as in South Asian uh, Americans. And the, uh, the, I can't now get the stats up off the top of my head, but it's, it's really, really high. It's something like 60% of motels are owned by um, Americans of Indian origin. And that, that actually, that there's, a, there's a kind of a phrase, the Patel Motel. Um, and that's quite interesting because one of the reasons why immigrant groups have been really drawn to motel management kind of in that sort of middle and lower sort of sector is exactly the same reasons why a lot of those people like the, the, the Brents and the Vogels who I pointed to when I was talking about the memoirs was the, is the fact that the, the businesses are really respond to family ownership because obviously you can divide your labor, you can, you know, it's also got ready accommodation. So, you know, you can use motel rooms for extended family. Um, you know, you can make use of, you can make use of of, uh, of many different people in different sort of aspects of, of the motel business. So I find that quite interesting that that, you know, sort of 50, 60 years later is, is still a, a still a point of, of interest. Um, and yeah, so that, that's one thing. There's also, um, yeah, there's other ways that motels have sort of diversified. Um, so, for example, um, some motels have become sort of quite nichely associated with certain types of gay cruising. I did have some really interesting search history at one point while writing the epilogue of my PhD. I had to explain to my husband that it was for academic research. Um, but, you know, there, there, are, um, there are motels that are sort of associated with particular sexual practices. Um, and, you know, the, these, are, these are, you know, very sort of vibrant spaces um, which people go to knowing specifically what they're going to get out of them. So it's, uh, yeah, they, they certainly, there's still a lot of interesting stuff there. And there's also actually a slightly sadder and darker, you, there's... Um, what some sociologists call the hidden homeless. So a lot of motels become places of kind of semi-permanent accommodation, you know, particularly for, for people who don't uh, have access to, to more permanent forms of housing. Um, and one, uh, an interesting sort of recent cultural product that I would point people to was a, a lovely film called The Florida Project, which I don't know if, if, if people saw, but it is a, a film um, and the, the, the little girl and her mother um, it, it live exactly this 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 um, kind of semi permanent life in these motels all around in in Florida. It's all around the um, the Disney uh, theme park, and so there's this this uh, this dichotomy between their life and the sort of fantasy life that's, that's being presented. So it's really it's really excellent. So I, I hope that's that's pointed to some of the other avenues that are, that's sort of interesting. Thank you. Um, so somebody asked, what was the name of the graphic novel you mentioned at the end of your presentation? Just to Sure. So it's called The Motel of the Mysteries, and it's by David McCauley um, from 1979. And um, it was it, it did really reasonably well in its in its original publication. So you can find secondhand copies quite easily. Uh, and so we have another question. What aspects or uh, or aspects of the motel do you think filmmakers and artists find as a great jumping off point for their stories? Well, I think that that really comes from the, you know, the fact that they are, are places of mixing, you know, that they're, you know, a bit like the, you know, the country, the, the English, you know, uh, country house party that, you know, is, is such a sort of wonderful option for kind of all those Agatha like, Christie murder mysteries, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a plot setting where you can bring disparate people together. That's often uh, quite, an, a, a, quite a noticeable uh, thread. Um, but also, you know, you do have the fact that these are quite destabilizing places, you know, that they are, you know, that they're neither, they're neither one thing or the other. People, you know, may find themselves there for a variety of, of reasons, um, you know, and so they can be containers for lots of different stories. And then obviously you do have the, you know, the more sort of transgressive elements, you know, so be it, you know, stories exploring, you know, substance abuse or prostitution, you know, motels are very... Um, <clears throat> are very popular for that but also I think that they it's partly their sort of ubiquitousness they are re they're a really quick sort of visual clue you know you know that you're in America I mean interestingly places like Australia have a sort of motel culture and history so they also have kind of large spaces um, but you know you if, if someone shows you a motel you know straight away that you're meant to assume that you're somewhere on an American you know highway so I think that that, you know, that they become a sort of shorthand. Um, I'm just trying to think, there was an interesting film, 
oh, was it early 2000s or late 90s called Identity, um, which played on all of these themes. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of theoretically a sort of slasher thriller film, um, but actually it, it, there's a big twist, which I don't want to ruin, but the, 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 whole, the whole kind of plotting and the twist are based on the fact that you bring, as a viewer, you bring all these cultural assumptions about the motel and about its treatment in kind of artistic representations to the story and kind of how you then experience it as a viewer. So kind of going on that, um, the next question is, um, you mentioned that motels have been associated with kind of unsavory conduct, justly or not. Um, has the motel industry tried to counter this perception or do you think it's encouraged it? Well, I, I pointed to a few sort of examples from kind of the early years where you, you know, you definitely do have, um, you know, publications like the Tourist Court Journal, which was obviously an industry newspaper, you know, arguing that, you know, it, it's not, you know, that it's very unfair to tarnish all motels with this brush. There's always going to be, you know, some people doing sort of unsavory things, um, which is obviously true. And that was true in, you know, in hotels or, you know, other forms of, you know, of, of lodging. Um, and obviously, you know, I think that quote I read, you know, using, you know, a, a new locale for an old plot, basically, um, which links to my previous answer. Um, but the one thing I find quite interesting about those management, motel management memoirs that I talked about from the 50s, um, and a lot of discussion of the of it during this sort of boom period is that, frankly, uh, you know, the writers producing these books know that a bit of the juiciness is what people want. You know, there's a, a bit of that sort of salacious stuff, um, you know, is, is what people are interested in. You know, they, they want to they want to know, you know, what it's like to sort of participate in, you know, the, the sort of get rich quick scheme of the decade. But also, you know, what, you know, that frankly, you know, what's it like when, you know, somebody's caught in flagrante um and so you know it, it really depends and one of the you know there's obviously there's many different it's a very very big industry and there's a lot of different kind of levels to it now and so you know you get you know sort of corporates um and obviously holiday inn really played on in its sort of early years in in the 50s and, and obviously onwards played on this sort of wholesome idea you know children always travel free with the family you know you didn't it was it was designed you know it was meant to appeal to to families um you know as a you know, you wouldn't have to worry about, you know, something unsavory happening. Um, yeah, I always think um, Bill Bryson, you know, the American the, the travel writer has some very funny kind of, obviously exaggerated for comic effect, but some very funny, you know, descriptions of, of his sort of staying in motels as a kid, you know, doing sort of family road trips in the 50s and 60s. And, you know, um, yeah, anyway, they're, they're, very, they're very fun, but it's, it's, you know, it's often sort of things heard through the wall and sort of, you know, fearful that, you know, someone's going to come crashing through the wall in the middle of a fight from the next door room or what have you. Um, but yeah, they, you know, it's, it's really, it's really different. And I think, um, you know, some, obviously, you know, the, 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 the more sort of established chains are always very keen to kind of present us a wholesome attitude. But as I say, some, you know, smaller businesses, frankly, continue to exist because they cater to transgressive behaviors um, and enable them to happen. And that's, you know, that's just how they work. Yeah, uh, interesting. I mean, it, I, I guess, uh, you know, uh, any kind of publicity is good publicity, <laughs> essentially, so. <laughs> Um, so we have time for one more question, um, and we're going to go with, do you have a favorite visual artist to whom the motel was a recurring symbol slash muse? Well, that's a great question, um, and actually is, is one of the areas where I, I've not done that much work. I mean, obviously they are very very ubiquitous and a lot of a lot of um you know uh like ed ruche or artists like that who've who played with the kind of the rep you know the rep repetitious quality of the roadside um i find those very evocative um but you know actually one of the things i most enjoy is is um and this is because i'm a geek is things like marketing materials you know i really enjoy the sort of ephemera that that you know that these businesses produce themselves um, and also, you know, as I've talked a little bit about sort of film and TV as sort of, you know, moving image representations, those I'm, I'm a bit more familiar with, but there's, there's really some wonderful ones, you know, and the, uh, yeah, I suppose Ed, Ed Ruscha would be a, would be a, a kind of one I've enjoyed. Um, yeah, I'll have to have a think about it, but it's one of those, one thing I like talking about motels is that there's always some angle you've not thought of or someone who's got an example that, you know, that, they'd, oh, you know, have you, have you come across this particular novel? You know, um, I, you know, I discovered that one of the James Bond novels um, is basically set in a motel. I was like, well, I had no idea about that, you know, and that was, that was a sort of fun, um, 
the spy who loved me someone's going to know that I've got that wrong but um yeah it's suddenly all set in you know certainly the opening sequence is is all set in a in a yeah sort of motel in the in the forest um so yeah there's the, it's a it's a really a uh, fertile topic which is why I've I've enjoyed sort of dipping in and out of it as a as a researcher over the years well, thank you so much, Cara, for taking the time to do this presentation and speak more about your research. Um, so I hope that everybody who's tuned in has enjoyed it. This recording will be available online. So um, for those who missed it or who'd like to watch it again, uh, it'll be available on our website at www.benjaminfranklinhouse.org. Um, we are making these talks available for free. Um, so, and as you know, a lot of cultural institutions are falling on hard times at the moment. So we would appreciate any donations that you'd be willing to make. Uh, no no too small an amount. Um, so um, yes, thank you very much. And uh, thank you again, Cara. Oh, not at all. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to, uh, to talk with you. Bye. Bye-bye.